afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you had a good, refreshing bowl break and that you are ready to learn more about large language models. Um, I sent an announcement this morning. I have released the third assignment. And what's different with this one is that you have a slightly shorter period to solve it. You have two weeks. And the deadline is going to be on Friday rather than Thursday, just to give you uh, a small uh, extension. Um, the standard late policy applies to uh, this and any upcoming um, assignment, meaning you can submit up to 48 hours late with uh, standard deductions, and you have two free passes if you haven't used them, You meaning you can be late without asking me for permission to be late. Uh, without getting a penalty. Um, yeah, I, I know that some of you are like, oh, initially we had more time for this. Um, uh, so yeah, my position is that um, I spread these assignments such that they are equally apart from each other. It's not the case that I deem that every assignment needs three or two weeks to be sold. I deem you can solve them way uh, quicker than uh, that. So I, uh, in my position is that you have enough time to solve this assignment and uh, making other changes like giving you now more time for this one would mean that I need to either shorten uh, the time you have for the other ones or uh, have you submit the assignments during the uh, final weeks, which in my experience would be the worst decision for you. Maybe now you are a little bit optimistic and you think you will sort things at time, but usually it happens that a lot of these things are left for the last week when you have the finals and I don't want you to put you in that position. So just be aware that the assignment is released. Please start working on it immediately and you have two weeks uh, and the deadline is October 25th. Any questions about that? Okay, I'm sure you are curious to know your grades. Uh, we are working on it. Uh, we will uh, have uh, both the second assignment and the midterm graded this week, uh, likely by the end of this week, uh, around Friday. Uh, so yeah, thanks for being patient. We'll get uh, that uh, graded uh, very, very soon. Okay, so today, uh, I want to continue with where we left. And to do that, I will kind of give like a little recap of kind of where we are at this moment. Um, so what we have been uh, kind of building towards to is learning how large language models work. What are they built of, right? So here is an example of something you might give to a large language model, uh, explains superconductors like I'm five years uh, old. And this is, a, this is um, an example of LLM here, could be ChatGPT. We have learned so far that the first thing that's gonna happen with this input is that it's going to be split into a sequence of tokens, right? And then we learned two kind of two paradigms for tokenization. Uh, what you have been using in your first assignment, a second assignment, and what was uh, done for the deep averaging neural networks, and when we used word embeddings like word to vec or glove embeddings, was that we split uh, the text more or less into words, right? Because we are uh, working with English uh, language in this course. If we had worked with, for example, Chinese language, maybe we have opted for the tokenization in characters. Um, and this is done, as I said, uh, before 2016, we had issues such as uh, the fact that we might not have in our vocabulary a given word that had appeared during the test time, and then we had no choice but to represent it with a special unknown token, which we have talked about how dissatisfactory that is. And we have also uh, learned about um, why the composition into characters is not great. We said, okay, for languages which do use word boundaries, then the model has to learn about what the boundaries of words are from scratch, which is way more learning than uh, the model needs to learn if we start with words. In 2016, when BPE was uh, introduced, which switched to subwords, we have learned that there will always be character fallout we don't have issue with unknown words anymore. We have characters, we have subwords, we have words, and everything we'll put into the vocabulary is learned through the data. Um, large language models, all of them will use subword tokenization. It's simply the tokenization we have used since 2016. 
So when I say here, okay, we are going to tokenize something into sequence of tokens from now on, you feel free to think about this as subword tokenization. From now on, the tokenization will always be the subword one. And we know that each token in the vocabulary has its own special ID. So the next thing is to represent uh, these tokens with the integer. And then we map this integer into high dimensional vectors. Uh, one thing that's kind of not illustrated here, but by now you surely know know about it because it was even in your exam and it was in the implementation of the uh, second assignment is that there is this notion of the embedding matrix where we have each token embedding connect concatenated row wise. So this embedding matrix has uh, the size of the number of tokens in the vocabulary times uh, dimensionality of uh, those uh, embeddings. Um, Okay, so each one of these integer is now a high dimensional uh, token, uh, a high dimensional vector, excuse me. So if we had here, I don't know, let's say there is uh, 18 tokens here. I don't know how many there are. Uh, this 18 uh, tokens will be represented with 18 times uh, D dimensional matrix because we have a uh, high dimensional vector for each one of them, as we know. And again, here we have seen two different things about how do we represent these, um, how, how do we uh, construct these high dimensional token embeddings. And pre-2018, uh, we have talked about word embeddings such as word to wec and glove that you have used. Uh, but since then, since transformers came to the scene, and I think this point was a little bit um, kind of unclear uh, to you when I taught this, the first layer of the transformer architecture is the embedding matrix that will initially be randomly initialized. And then when we pre-train these transformers with let's say language modeling objective, we are going to change all of the transformers weights, including the embeddings. And now these embeddings will be uh, some vectors that capture aspects of meanings of these tokens such that the model can do language modeling tasks better. And you simply need to trust me that then these aspects of meanings that need to be captured in this token embeddings have to be um, not superficial. Again, we need to mm, have a notion of similarity, relatedness, antonymy, and so on. Okay, and once uh, the, the model is pre-trained, then we use the whole transformer again to do something with it. And now important distinction with the transformer-based approach since 2018 and the word to wec stuff we have talked about before is that token embeddings are now part of the architecture we are using for the downstream applications such as like sentiment classification or whatever our task is. We are not looking for some other source of these token embeddings that are part of our model. Okay, continuing talking about what you already know. So this is just a recap of stuff we have talked about so far. Uh, once we have a token embedding for each token in a given sequence, we have done, then done a sequence of transformations of each one of these tokens. We have first used self-attention, which, which kind of gave the, and I will anthropomorphize a little bit here, it gave a capacity to each one of these tokens to look around and see um, what is important about this other token, which information this other token gives to this specific token to change its own representation. So we were changing with self-attention representation of each token embedding such that now it captures information about other tokens in a sequence relative to importances of those tokens to a given token. We have done that. And then after uh, we have done that, we got a new contextualized token embedding. And then we had also a sequence of nonlinear transformations through our feedforward neural networks. But the point here, the higher level of abstraction is that we just this sequence, we did the sequence of nonlinear and contextualized representation and the outcome the final from the from the final uh, representation in the transformer will again be for every single token so from high dimensional token embeddings we went to another sequence of high dimensional token embeddings okay so here we are so we now have a sequence of token embeddings but 
what you see when you use ChatGPT or any other language model is a is a sequence of tokens, right? Like you see an actual string such as imagine you have a super slippery slide and you want to send a toy car down it, blah, blah, blah. And then what we talked about previously is how now we go from these sequences of tokens into a sequence of, uh, excuse me, how we go from sequences of high dimensional vectors or embeddings into this uh, string, into this sequence of token responses. And if you remember the part of your decoder uh, was to take the token uh, embedding from the final uh, semi-final uh, layer of your decoder um, transformer. So you take whatever was the last token here, the last token, let's say is old dot, I don't know what exactly it is, but let's say that's the last token we had uh, from our input. Given the high, like highly nonlinear, highly contextualized embedding of that last token, you are making a prediction of what the next token is gonna be. So we take that vector coming from, again, our decoder blocks, the final ones, uh, and we multiply it as always when we have output layer. This is, again, something I want you to see whether it landed for you in your midterm. When we have output layer, all it means do the linear transformation into the number of classes we have, which is for us the number of tokens in the vocabulary. You get the logits or unnormalized values. Then you apply softmax to get a notion of probability distribution from which you can take either the highest, uh, most likely uh, token as the one you display or you sample from some of the highly uh, probable tokens. Okay. And once we have displayed one token, let's say we chose the most probable one according to this distribution we have just calculated, we uh, expand, we, we add that token to our prompt. And now our prompt basically becomes one token longer and you repeat this until you reach the end of sequence uh, token. Yeah, this is just a reminder that we have talked about uh, kind of decoding from two, I would say, in, they're not two extremes, but two kind of opposing approaches. One where you always take the most likely token and the other one where you, where you sample from a few highly likely token and how many uh, likely tokens will depend on the uh, given uh, distribution calculated by softmax and whether it's flat or peaky. Okay, so then by the end of our first part of this course, uh, after we have learned how to go from the input to, to this um, you know, response that you can actually see with your eyes, uh, we talked about, well, how do models actually become capable of knowing what the next token is going to be? And we have, I have introduced to you um, a slightly modified now version of supervised machine learning, where I said, well, instead of starting from randomly initialized, weights, you are going to start from some weights that are obtained through pre-training a language model with either mask language modeling or language modeling objective. So this capacity of um, predicting the next token comes both from pre-training, and if you have a specialized task you're interested in, it also comes from fine-tuning. Quick recap of these three, two options. One option was to start uh, as always with the large corpus. Kyle told us what to do with this large corpus and then use decoder only or encoder decoder transformer. Pre-train it to predict the next token. Um, and we use the next token that had actually appeared in the corpus for our supervision. If we wanna fine tune a model, we start with this pre-trained transformer model meaning we use the weights we obtain through pre-training, not some random ones. We cast each task as a sequence to sequence generation task, although it might not be something you think about as a six to six task, like binary classification. With this approach, you simply cast everything as sequence to sequence. You use the label data for supervision and you continue training a model as conditional language model to generate labels like positive or negative. And the nice thing here is that because we have generation during pre-training, we had generation during fine tuning, uh, we don't need to change any layers of our transformer architecture. We can just continue tweaking the numbers into weight matrices. 
We have also learned about another option, which is starts again with the large corpus, but uses encoder only transformer and adds the special CLS token at the beginning of each text and then the separator tokens to separate the different, uh, different texts. Instead of predicting the next token, we are predicting the mass token. We again use the token that had actually been in the mass position for supervision. We fine tune this model, usually for classification task by starting with the pre-trained transformer encoder only model. One thing that's special here is that we use the final token embedding of the special CLS token as the representation of the entire input. And due to self-attention, we can do that because the CLS token contains a little bit of information from all other tokens. Um, unlike previous option where we didn't need to change any of the transformer layers, remember that here we had to replace our output layer, which was giving us distribution over vocabulary to give us uh, distribution over the number of classes we have, which are, let's say in the case of binary classification two. And then you use the label dust data for supervision. You tweak all of the transformer weights, including the pre-trained ones and the newly uh, introduced ones. And this option continues to be fine if you have classification tasks for if which you have maybe thousands of labeled instances. These models will usually be smaller, hundreds of million parameters, unlike few billion parameters that we use with decoder and encoder decoder model. And you can think of them and people will refer to them as specialists because you can specialize them for particular classification purposes. Whereas uh, models that we get uh, through option one, I have uh, kind of uh, overviewed again, they're usually intended to be general purpose, to serve many, many purposes. And um, you know for these ideas of giving some kind of an instruction and following it without being super specialized for a given task. Okay, so at this point, I just retold you what you ideally already uh, know. And this is just to set up um, what comes next. Now we are moving into territory of post-2020. Now a new idea, after people have done all of what I told you so far, people, experts in this uh, field, NLP and uh, larger, uh, broader AI, has started to think about this idea that there might be some layperson, some domain experts that uh, they are not an NLP experts. Let's say they are a journalist or a lawyer, doctor, whoever, and they have no access to the model par parameters. Or even if they had access to model weights, they didn't take this course, so they wouldn't have no idea how to change the weights of those models to, you know, uh, specialize it for a given task. However, they are able to provide to a model instruction of what they want the model to do. And they're also capable of providing potentially a few examples of what they want the model to achieve. And in 2020, this uh, idea to actually uh, realize language technology that could help people like this became something that's felt more tangible and it became this new direction to go uh, into. It, it was popularized by the GPT-3 playground. So now what is ChatGPT uh, in 2020 was something we just called the playground. It looked quite similar and you could just ask GPT-3 at the time, things like you would ask today. It was just way, way worse. Uh, back, uh, at the, back, back then, uh, the chat GPT level of capabilities were simply not nowhere close, right? So the many of these responses were actually quite disappointing and you couldn't actually do something with them. They were meant more for their researchers. Uh, uh, you know, our parents didn't know about uh, chat GPT-3 uh, playground as they might know about chat GPT today. So because LLMs at the time, 2020, didn't really work so well uh, when we were just giving them any kind of instruction and expecting them to follow it without tweaking their parameters through fine tuning, a new line of work had emerged, which collectively is known as prompt engineering. This is the idea that you iteratively try to structure an instruction 
that can be interpreted and understood by large language models or other generative AI like text to image generators. So we kind of in 2020 sense that, all right, there are some capabilities here, but actually having the model perform that capability wasn't as simple as today, where more or less you kind of come from the position, well, ChatGPT will understand this instruction and sometimes you do craft it to follow it a little bit better, where at the time it really took more effort to achieve this. Okay, um, I recommend that you also check this uh, big survey and overview uh, because it has way more than I will be able to tell you uh, to today because since 2020, really a lot has happened. And just to illustrate that, I will show you here this huge taxonomy of things that had happened since 2020. And today we are gonna cover basically these three first branches and you can see how today uh, or more recently, there are way more things that people uh, are trying to in for the goal of having these large language models uh, produce uh, wanted response, giving your uh, prompt. Okay, so let me stop here just to see uh, whether we are all on the same page. Um, so what we are going to try to learn today is how to, how, like learn how LLMs like ChatGPT uh, are managing to respond to many instructions we are given uh, these models without fine tuning these models, without actually downloading their weights and uh, changing the parameters of the model to specialize them for the task. Um, and what I wanna talk about next is some prompting techniques, how people go about, uh, you know, eliciting wanted responses from LLMs without having, you know, tweaking any of their parameters. Any questions so far? Okay. Well, first of all, what is a prompt? I will tell you that prompt is an overloaded term. So we use it in many different ways and then get obsessed with having a definition of what a prompt is. But you can think about prompt being an input we give to a large language model that usually has these uh, components. Again, they don't, a prompt does not need to have all of these components to be a legit prompt. These are just some of the things you might hear together with the notion of a prompt. So usually you have uh, some high level directive or instruction, usually in a form of uh, an instruction or a question, such as tell me five good books to read. That's usually what you will see in a prompt. And maybe for now you are thinking these are synonym, instruction and the prompt. However, in a prompt, you can also give examples, few examples of the task. We call them examples, examples, exemplars, demonstrations, or shots. You will hear a uh, different way of people referring to just the idea of giving few examples of the task. So tell me five good books to read. For example, I can maybe serve a few of you and you give me five books each and then I uh, give to the model uh, first, tell me, uh, tell me five good books to read here. Here are some examples. And then I list a few examples of five books. Um, very often you want the model to respond in a more constrained way that you can then later analyze. Remember, these models have a lot of flexibility of how they can express themselves, especially if we use nuclear sampling and if we set values for top P to be larger. So um, very often we want to kind of constrain the way that the model express, uh, expresses it itself and uh, we need to specify this. So very often in prompts you will see people specifying in which way to respond. Um, and uh, this can be either in a specific format, like a CSV table or, I don't know, a graph or whatever you have in mind. And another way to achieve this is through style uh, instructions, such as here, for example, write a clear, and um, I don't know, what is this? Write a clear uh, paragraph about llamas. And another thing people often do 
Fatima loves this one, is uh, giving personas and uh, and roles such as pretend you are a shepherd and write a limer brick about llamas. I don't think we still know what the effects of how these are, uh, like uh, roles are, but very often you will see them in prompts and uh, maybe there is some idea that this helps models to do the task even better by trying to pretend they are experts on these topics. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I still wonder why, but I have no idea. So you will see these uh, various things uh, as being part of the prompt. So again, uh, maybe only one thing is included, maybe only instruction, and that could be prompt, or all of these things are included, and that could be a prompt as well. So again, don't get obsessed with what the prompt is exactly. It's You can think about it, the easiest way to think about it is an input to give to an LLM. All right. So. That's what the components of a prompt are. I will show you here one example from my own research. Here we were working on a reading comprehension uh, task, which is a task of answering questions in the context of a given uh, text, such as Wikipedia paragraph. And here we started with a high level instruction or directive. In this task, we are expected to write answers to questions involving reasoning about negation. The answer to the question should be yes, no, don't know, or a phrase in the passage questions can have only one correct answer. So you see, I have given an instruction, but we have also given the way to constrain the output, to kind of hint to the model that yes, no, don't know is the most likely uh, answer choice here. And then we give a task instance that we want to know the prediction for. In this case, as I said, this is a question answering uh, problem. So you have a passage, you have a question, and then you want the model to provide an answer. And very often you will also start with like things like answer semicolon to kind of hint to the model. Yeah, now it's your turn to give me an answer. Okay, and then the model just generates the answer as a conditional text generator uh, using the next token uh, prediction that we know. This is an example of a prompt. But it's also an example of what we call zero shot prompt. And the reason we call it zero shot is because no training data was used and included in this prompt. So let me go over this zero shot prompting idea a little bit more formally. So this approach, when you have your input, your prompt being some kind of task instruction and evaluation example you want the prediction for, where and you get uh, the output is just the answer where you don't change for the weights the model parameters further therefore this is prompting this is called zero shot prompting uh, or more broadly zero shot uh, learning in mach is a machine learning framework in which uh, your model should learn to make accurate predictions for a given task without any number of training examples for that specific task and you might wonder, excuse me, why would a model ever know how to do perform a task if he have never seen the instances of the task? And this is connected to idea of transfer learning, that there some tasks are similar to each other. So if you learn how to, let's say, summarize something, you maybe have implicitly learned how to simplify something, or although those are not exactly the same, two same tasks. So maybe although I trained my model to do summarization, maybe later I wanted to see whether it can do just simplification of a text and it managed to kind of transfer the knowledge from summarization into a new task of um, simplification. Yeah. What was the passive Prompt is the all of it. Yeah. We don't have any expected output. Uh, here, an expected output is that the model should answer no to this question. Yeah. So they Yeah. So again, um, let me just go over this uh, one more time. Um, the task is reading comprehension, answering questions in the context of a given text, here a passage. That's the task, right? So your task, as always in NLP, will have data. You have your test data. 
And for you want to evaluate a model on your test data. So you need to give it one instance at a time and check what the model predicts, what, the, what its answer is. And you need to compare it with the human authored answer for that instance, which serves as a ground truth. And then you compare the two and you say, well, the model was accurate or not for a given instance. And here you can report uh, accuracy. How many questions did the model answer correctly? That's the task. Now, we could, um, in this specific um, data set, imagine there are only two, three possible answers, yes, no, or don't, don't know. So you can also classify each question in three classes. We could use the training data of this data set and fine tune models we have learned about already, right? Like those that are pre-trained with, with any of those two objectives we talked about. That's one option. But here we are talking now about a completely different setup where we do not want to use the training data. So we are just using the pre-trained model and we are hypothesizing that because the model has been pre-trained on all of those data that now it had uh, learned all of these new capabilities such as answering questions. And to test that, you are giving again to your language model one instance at a time, except that now you just craft it a little bit more to give it more directive to the model. So previously, what was what is green here, that's something you would give to any model to evaluate it. That's simply what you must give, right? But here, what is in purple is a little bit more directive to the model of what the task is that we expect it to do, because in this setup, unlike with fine tuning, where through the data, you are telling the model what to do, here, it doesn't have anything except our directive, right? So, that's the zero shot setup, directive to do something, an instance, no training examples makes it zero shot. And of course, your immediate reaction, if you have never seen anything like this, could be why, why would model now do question answering if we have just pre-trained it with the next token prediction? And it is simply empirically had been shown that yes, if you do train models with the next token prediction on a large corpora, they will have these capacities to some extent, to the extent of 2020 models. But today we are going to learn what people have done to improve all of this in 2022 and why today's models actually have more capacity to do these things. And the kind of spoiler is that we have actually given it a lot of label data as a part of another pre-training stage. But let's, let's just go back to these different ways of prompting models. So here we have zero shot prompting, just we just given a directive together with the instance with want the model to do something for us. And this is hard, right? Like this is really, really hard because uh, model literally has nothing but what it has learned previously to do this. Um, I will come back to this, but I want to share another thing you can do, which is a very simple extension of zero shot prompting, where now we also include few examples or shots or demonstrations. So we give the model directive of what to do, but we also give it, let's say, eight examples of uh, question answer pairs. The important distinction between the evalu evaluation instance and the demonstrations is that for the demonstrations, you're actually giving the answers, the gold human authored answers, because you are teaching the model through these demonstrations, what the task is and how should one answer it? How should one go about it, right? So everything we have uh, changed here in this prompt is just give these a few demonstrations that I color here in blue. More formally, so here you have task instructions, then labeled examples, and then finally your evaluation instance without the answer and the model needs to produce this answer. This is called in-context learning, a very important term that you will see all around in this line of work. And this is one example of how to do so-called few-shot learning. Few shot learning being a machine learning framework where you want your machine learning model to learn accurate predictions for a given task, 
by training this model on a very few number of instances. Usually you will see something like eight, 16, max 32. Not necessarily max, but my if I read more than 32, I will feel like that's too many uh, examples. Okay, so I want to actually demo right now for you how to uh, do some of these prompting stuff. Let me just try to get out of here. Uh, I, I feel like from my experience teaching this, uh, one thing that kind of uh, gets missed is that this is one single string, right? Like this prompt is a single string that we give as an input to the model. So, and the prompt engineering is just how do you construct that string, right? Like it's uh, it's mostly writing Python for producing a string. Okay, so this is another one of those notebooks. Um, remember I have already showed you hugging, and then I talked about hugging face. So now we are gonna continue talking, doing stuff in hugging face. For your last two assignments, you will be doing things yourself in hugging face. Uh, here, uh, previously, I have shown you how to fine tune an encoder only transformer, a pre trained bit mask language modeling objective, namely the Bertha version 3 large, I believe. Now, uh, I will first show you what do you change if you are using uh, decoder models or sequence to sequence tasks uh, in uh, Hugging Face? All right, so you pip install Hugging Face as always. Uh, is this visible? All right, cool. All right, so uh, remember we were working with sentiment classification and we had uh, in both in your assignments in the previous demo, we had two classes. Um, remember that every single pre trained model has their choice of a tokenizer. Once they have produced their tokenizer, they have a vocabulary. And only when they have vocabulary, they can have an embedding matrix, which is the first layer of a transformer, right? So tokenizers precede everything and different pre-trained language models have their own tokenizer. So you always have to load the tokenizer connected with your own with the model you're interested in working with. So here I'm gonna work with the Flenty5. At the end of this lecture, you'll know what Flenty5 is. Again, uh, I went to Hugging Face Hub. I checked what the actual name of for Flenty5 is. I'm gonna use small version here. And then you are using from pre-trained to get your tokenizer. Uh, remember how I tried to convince you last time how nice these auto classes are? I told you, well, you don't really need to care which tokenizer uh, is implemented by Flenty5 authors or the Berta authors. And now if you ask me, hey, which tokenizer did, did the Berta people use and which one Flenty5 people will use? I will tell you that I don't know because I'm just using the auto, auto tokenizer, loading whatever tokenizer they have. It's certainly gonna be a subword tokenization, but it can have different, uh, there are different algorithms. You have learned one subword tokenizer, BPE, there are others like word piece, for example, which we didn't talk about. Okay, so nice thing, I don't need to care. I don't need to go back to the paper. I don't need to implement it, nothing. I just use auto tokenizers and I use from pre-trained function. Here, I always like to check how many tokens there are in a vocabulary. You can see 32,000. Uh, and now, one thing gets different when you're using these uh, approach where you are going to generate labels instead of having an output layer dedicated to that specific number of uh, labels. Here, you need to transform your labels into strings to be decoded by a model, right? We are training a model, if we are training it, to produce a string, a thing that is gonna decode, right? So our labels need to be strings, and in the pre-processing strap, you need to do that. Whereas previously, we didn't need to do that because we had used encoder-only model, and we were introducing a new output layer that we were training from scratch for the, for the task. Is that clear? Why are we doing this pre-processing step? I would rather someone say, no, it's not, let's go over it again, than this, you're missing this point. Not clear, okay. So let's go over this again. Um, and maybe I'll write it on the board. Okay. 
well, I would if I did bring the thing to write. Oh, there is one. Okay, so important thing is to remember those two options for pre-training and fine-tuning. One option was to pre-train a model with the next token prediction and then fine-tune it by having the model generate with the next token prediction objective, the labels. So let's say our task is preview to either positive or negative. Remember how you were implementing the labels in your assignments? There were zeros and ones, right? Like this was one, this was zero. So this is important to also keep in mind. So when we have the first option where we uh, are doing the next token prediction, here you are given as an input to your model uh, review. Again, tokenize, tokens transform into IDs, IDs into embeddings. And what, is, what do we do with the, what the model does is generates, given this review, what we tell it should generate from the training data. And from the training data, we, training, we, we have either positive or negative labels. So I don't know how useful is what I have written on the board, but with the first option where we have next token prediction, we are training our model by providing input output pairs, input being review, output being a string with the label such as positive in this case. The model needs to generate this uh, word. So from the, uh, imagine that, this is our softmax output, and this is the number of tokens in the vocabulary. Remember, this is the last thing we have in this space. From here, the model should generate a word corresponding to positive. So this one should have the highest probability, or that's at least what we are training the model to do. One caveat here is that some of these labels under your tokenization can be split into multiple tokens, such as what if the positive is something like this? This is what your model generates. You have two tokens instead of one. What people usually do is just look at the first uh, token to check what the, is the first token generated. When you are training the model to do this, when you're giving the data to generate label strings, it won't spiral and start generating something that's not limited to the options you have given it, such as positive or negative. However, when you're doing this prompting stuff where you do not fine tune the model, where you do not change the weights, now the model can start generating things like synonyms of positive, like good, great, amazing. And this is where that uh, stuff about constraining the outputs comes into a play. Like giving few demonstrations will help with this, that the model down, doesn't overgenerate something that is out of your space of possibilities and challenges your evaluation. Okay, so this was one, uh, one uh, option. The other one was uh, mask language modeling as pre-training, followed by just the standard fine-tuning with um, a new output layer. Okay, so here with this option, we have replaced our output layer, which was transforming the token embeddings into the distribution of our vocabulary. We're changing it with the output layer that gives us a uh, distribution over a number of classes we are interested in. And this needs to be learned from scratch. So here you stick with your one and zero notation because you don't need, you're not generating tokens 
the actual strings anymore, you are classifying into one or zero, right? So you have the uh, output matrix that multiplied with the embedding will give you a two dimensional uh, vector for binary classification cl uh, case where you apply softmax and then whatever is argmax of that two dimensional vector will be the predicted uh, label that you can compare with zero or one. This is what we have learned when we learned fee forward neural networks. So going back to this code, unlike here, where we could stick here, where we could stick with zeros and ones, now we need to transform our zeros and ones into actual strings, like positive. Okay, so here, everything that's being done is changing the one into string positive and zero into string negative. Yeah. What's the first one, like why should they produce the promise of so yeah, the advantage is kind of uh, hard to say it precisely. The advantage is, is the fact that the latest L language models have been fine-tuned, have been pre-trained like this. So your best language models are uh, pre-trained with the language modeling objective, and uh, turns out that you actually don't need a um, ton of data to get the these models to work for your task. So, but in that case, you need to stick with the output layer you have. You can, and nothing stops you from doing this, replace the output layer from pre-training here with the new output layer specialized for your task. And this is something people say, uh, call, add the classification head at top of this model. That's something people will say. You can do that. It just, I think, turns out that you don't really need to do it. In your, this will work equally well. So like why bother is, is basically the practical consideration. Yeah, well, watch out what are we comparing here. Uh, if you are comparing uh, these two approaches as fine tuning approaches, the only difference is are you generating the label? Are you training the model to generate the label or to predict in these uh, classes? And um, I think there, once you have the data and when you are doing this in a two different ways, empirically, you won't see a huge difference, either generating the label or uh, predicting it into the classes as you have learned. Uh, original. However, when we move to prompting, then you definitely need to keep the output layer in the first approach you had. Uh, otherwise, things won't work as nicely. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's move, move forward. Um, so this was just about pre-processing. And then remember, we needed to, um, um, yeah, use the map function to tokenize each one of our inputs and also change now uh, the uh, labels into strings. Now, if we want to fine tune a decoder model, uh, this is an encoder decoder transformer, excuse me, um, and you want to fine tune it as a sequence to sequence model, then instead of using that uh, auto model for sequence classification we have used before, which would be basically do this, add a new output layer, replace the old one from pre-training, add a new one. Here, uh, auto model for sequence to sequence will fine tune the model in a sequence to sequence manner, meaning given a sequence, generate another sequence. Specifically for here, given a movie review, generate a sequence positive or a sequence negative. So one thing you need to be careful with is uh, which uh, which one of these classes you're going to use because they will have different behaviors. But once you have the auto class you want, then again, just from pre-train to load the model weights and then you are good to go. Um, again, you need your training arguments where you store your hyperparameters. You need, your, uh, you need to define your metric. And uh, again, we do have accuracy, but uh, here... Um, we are using the uh, 
decoding to get the label. So things change just a little bit about how we actually get the prediction, where previously we did the argmax from the uh, vector. If we had two classes, two dimensional vector, here we are decoding and then uh, getting the actual uh, string that's been decoded, for example. Uh, you will need to use sequence to sequence trainer instead of just trainer. Uh, and unfortunately, this this is still training. It's kind of stuck. I don't know for which reason. So yeah, just to recap, here we are and just demoed you uh, how to fine tune a sequence to sequence model, which is opposed to fine tuning uh, and encoder only model. And the main difference being that the output layer is not now a new output layer, rather the output layer we had from the pre-training. And the difference is that we are generating strings, uh, uh, which corresponds to labels. So that was still about fine tuning, but today's lecture is about prompting, how to get the models to do something without training them to do that, right? And um, we will again have our auto tokenizer, auto model for sequence to sequence to load the model. Let me just kill this. Okay. All right. And a pointer that I often give to my students is to look at Flenty 5's collections of prompts, where you can see how they designed prompts for 1800 tasks. So it's a great source to go about like, okay, how, how could I instruct the model to uh, do uh, something? So let's try to do the zero shot stuff. Here we are again, uh, given the model some directive, uh, for example, here, I started my prompt with review semicolon, where I give the SST sentence. And then I ask, is this movie review sentence negative or positive? New line, the answer is column. So this is my prompt. I'm giving my uh, instruction and I'm giving the example for which I want the predict uh, prediction for, right? Important thing here to notice is that there are no examples, demonstrations from the tra training data. So this is an example of zero shot prompting. If I can be sure that my test data and my data set, um, excuse me, that my data set was not being used as a part of training. If this data set, this sentiment uh, data if it's training data was used for some reason as the part of pre-training, then this is no longer zero shot. Okay, so I do that. I need to tokenize my prompt as always. Model.generate is just an hugging face function that given the prompt will give you the completion. Uh, so next token prediction, instead of you writing a for loop that uh, does all the things we have said, you know, predicts the next token, appendices it to the uh, prompt and so on, model.generate will do that for you. Uh, decode function is, and here batch decode, is going to go from uh, these um, uh, distributions over vocabulary into the actual tokens to display. And then from here, uh, let me see, you can see here, that I have decoded word positive for this instance, and the gold label turns out to also be positive. Um, let me maybe also read. So here, entertaining if someone standardized action predicted positive gold positive. Um, let's run this again. The emotions seem authentic, positive, positive. A larger than life figure, positive, positive. All right, so maybe you're noticing here that the labels are actually matching, predicted labels are act matching uh, gold labels. And I want to repeat this because maybe you have zoned out for a moment and didn't hear that we switch from fine-tuned model into a model that's not fine-tuned. So we have just loaded Flenty 5, and we are giving Flenty5 these sentiment instances, and somehow it's just successfully predicting them into the right label, okay? Um, this is kind of cool, right? We didn't do 
imagine I didn't tell you anything about fine tuning sequence to sequence models. Imagine not me just jumping into prompting and then showing you that, yeah, like everything you have done in the second assignment, you don't actually need to train anything and you just get this prediction uh, maybe, maybe would make you uh, happy. Okay, so that's an example of zero shot prompting. Um, an example of few shot prompting or in context learning. The only difference now is that we are adding few demonstrations. So everything I have here is just about producing this string I want, which has the instruction, it has my few demonstrations, and it has the evaluation instance for which I want the sentiment label. So here I define, I will have number of shots, number of training demonstrations is gonna be eight. Uh, then I load my training data. From my training data, I randomly select eight instances. And later for your evaluation purposes, believe me that the choice of these demonstrations matters. So if I choose uh, some eight demonstrations and then prompt the models, I might get different performance than if I have chosen another eight. So you here, you are going to randomly select few, and usually we repeat this whole evaluation, let's say five times with eight different choices of shots. And then we report the average performance to kind of count in for possible variation coming from the choices of the demonstrations. Okay, so here, each one of these demonstration will be uh, converted into a, my um, kind of um, um, here, basically each one of them will be review semicolon, demonstration, is this movie review sentence negative or positive, the answer is, and then for demonstration, I will actually give the string, I will actually edit. Okay, I do that, then I get my evaluation instance. I just want a single one. Uh, I'm also converting it into a prompt, but I am uh, not gonna be using the evaluation output and include it into the prompt that I'm giving to the model. You can see here that I'm shuffling the order of my demonstrations. The reason I do this is because the order of demonstration can also influence the model's ability to do this. And if you want to do rigorous evaluation, you will randomly shuffle the order every time you prompt a model to count in for the variation that might come from the order of demonstrations. All right, so then I just concatenate my demonstrations with my evaluation instance input, but not the output, of course, that's something we are trying to predict. I tokenize the entire prompt Given the prompt, I generate the model's responses, and then it gives me again either positive uh, or negative. Oh, excuse me, I didn't run this one. Okay, so from all of this, I just hope you are gathering that when we are doing prompting, again, meaning um, instructing models to do something without changing the model's ways through fine tuning, um, that Prompting is just a matter of constructing this string that we are going to give to the model. And with the zero shot prompting, we are not gonna use any training demonstrations and uh, with few shot prompting, or as it's known in context learning, we will use few demonstrations. Now, another major thing that had happened in 2022 uh, was that uh, people, researchers have discovered that if you can change this few shot prompt just slightly to get much better performance for reasoning tasks such as mathematical reasoning. And that's to also give this directi directive to the model to think step by step. So only thing that has now changed in my string, that string representing my prompt that I'll give to the model, is that when I give answer semicolon, I added this. Let's think step by step. And here I give free form reasoning about why something is gonna be the answer. I'm not gonna read all of this because these are quite complex instances, but this is just reasoning provided in plain English. And then you finish with, so the answer is, let's say here, don't know. Okay, and then when you are giving your evaluation instance, you don't have the explanation. You shouldn't be assuming to give it to the model. 
So for evaluation instance, you just give answer semicolon, let's think step by step. And again, um, you should kind of abstract this away. Not We don't need to exactly use answer semicolon, let's think, think step by step. Rather, um, if you are prompting the model to give you explanation in free form plain English language together with its prediction, that's what's known as chain of thought prompting. We are prompting to model to give chain of its thoughts, step of reasonings to uh, together with its answer. Or one specific instance, one specific way to realize chain of thought prompting can be that, as I've shown you, that you have uh, answer semicolon, let's think, think step by step, explanation, so the answer is answer. This has been major uh, because it had really uh, introduced big benefits for reasoning tasks. Since then, people have shown that not always it helps for every single uh, reasoning task, so you should just compare it to using it uh, and not using it. Um, but if you had followed also the most recent developments in the GPT world and heard about O1, then you might have also heard that this idea had also been taken to another level where now we also have very more complex algorithms to produce um, these chain of thoughts. Uh, they are combined with the very standard AI algorithms like search. So you are searching for the best uh, sequence of chain of thoughts. And uh, they have speculated that the OpenAI developers had also trained the models, uh, tweaked them to do these kinds of things uh, better, which then uh, makes hypothetically the latest model, which is O1. So what I want you to remember in 2020, Chain of Thoughts has been released. It's prompting the model to also provide its reasoning in free form language together with its answer. Since then, uh, it has been even more expanded to kind of have these models do reasoning tasks uh, uh, better, which is what they have been struggling with. Okay, uh, questions about zero shot, few shot, or in context learning chain of thought prompting. Okay, so I told you that in 2020, when GPT-3 has been released, um, these things didn't work quite so well. You could give instructions by the model and these kinds of prompts, but uh, they wouldn't give you correct answer with not even a close rate with which they give you today. And what has changed in 2020 is that we had, I mean, we, the creators of large language models, have added another big stage of training. Terminology is now fuzzy. Very often people will refer to pre-training the way you know it. And then to this next stage, some people will say another round of pre-training. But I think today people are converging to calling this next rounds of training post-training. Although it's not post-training that you do, it's still post-training that LLM developers do to give us weights that we are all going to use for a, you know, for downstream purposes. But important thing that had happened is that after we do pre-training with either language modeling, today very often language modeling, not mask language modeling, had kind of mm, disappeared from the scene. So today you will see language modeling. We have our big corpora, we train with the language modeling, we use trillions of tokens. And then the next stage is to do supervised machine learning. Bunch of data is collected where we have actual human authored responses. What should, what should the model do given uh, a prompt? And given that data, label data, you are further training the model. By you, I mean still large language models developers do another uh, stage where they are training the model again with the next token prediction, but not now the data is not some internet data anymore. It's a human compiled data. 
And this stage is called instruction fine tuning because you're fine tuning the model to follow the instructions. The size of the data will of course be way smaller than the internet data. The label data doesn't just lay around, right? Uh, unfortunately. Once you do that, so this is uh, this pre-trained uh, pre model will often be referred to as a base model. And then when you do supervised fine tuning, uh, this model will be called SFT model, which stands for S for supervised, FT for fine tuning. Once you have SFT model, there will be another round of post-training for safety that we'll talk about on Wednesday. Okay, so a massively important uh, round, a post-training stage, instruction fine-tuning, post-training stage where an LLM is fine-tuned, meaning that weights are changed to follow instructions, uh, including instructions where we provide a few demonstrations. LLM developers, engineers in Meta, Google, OpenAI, Anthropic, whoever, will do this once for their LLM, and then they will release so-called instruct version of their LLM. So very often you will see, as I said, uh, for example, Llama, uh, Llama 3 base, meaning the one which is just pre-trained with the pre-training you know, and then Llama 3 instruct very often means um, the uh, version of their language model after instruction fine tuning. And then on Wednesday, we will learn about chat version, which is comes from another round of post-training. So I'm, I'm saying this because I don't want you to get confused to think that you need to do this. You just need to download weights available on Hugging Face that come uh, after this uh, stage of uh, uh, training that someone else has already done. An example of this model is so-called Plantify model that was released in 2022. Uh, one of these first uh, models uh, that had been um, introduced is another stage of training at top of the pre-training stage. And it has been uh, fine-tuned to follow instructions. Uh, they have also included in their training data this chain of thoughts to elicit this ability of models to produce explanations when we tell them let's think step by step. And they have also introduced uh, examples in their training data where they concatenate few examples such that models are better in context learners. And to do this, they use the data for from 1800 tasks coming mostly from academia. Uh, just to give you an uh, illustration coming from their paper of what these tasks include, it includes everything from common sense reason, question generation, uh, qu uh, question answering, context generation, topic classification, uh, and so on. So imagine just the field producing lots of lots of label data set and they have put them together in a nice collection that they can then use to do this second stage of post training. But this is an enormous amount of data. If this is uh, 1,800 tasks, if each one of these tasks has just 1,000 instances, and I can tell you they have way more than just 1,000, then this amounts to almost 2 million labeled data instances. Once people have done this, the ability to follow instructions was way better. And what I want you to remember is that labeled data was important ingredient here. Um, so the 2020 GPT-3 could not follow any instructions. And then 2022 models that were fine-tuned with label data started to follow many instructions way better. So when you read articles, when they say this ability to do things just emerge from the pre-training internet data, you now know that's not the case, right? Because we have also given a bunch of label data for the models to learn how to follow any kinds of instructions. So only once this was done in 2020, we had newer generations of LLMs that were actually useful and started to bleed outside of academia and into, you know, as you know, uh, the history uh, all the way to ChatGPT. I do want to emphasize though that uh, the most latest uh, large language models in this stage, do not use only human label data. They are also using 
the data generated by previous iteration of their model as well. And they are also using so-called synthetic data that was created automatically for the purposes um, to you know, target specific tasks like coding. So one thing to remember is that in 2020, people have used this compilation of academic data sets, human labeled academic data sets. But this, since then, this also had kind of change into a mix of academic data sets uh, with model generated data with uh, synthetic data targeting specific uh, capabilities. And these creators of these uh, LLMs, they know what people kind of want from these LLMs today. So they will also pick what to include depending on what's relevant. For example, today it's very relevant that mo models can do mathematical reasoning and code because for a bit, those were the limitations of the model. So if you could show that your language model is way better at doing any of these things, then that was a, like a big advance. People would pay attention to your LLM. So developers also then started to craft the uh, instruction fine tuning data such that the downstream you know, purposes are tailored to what people, both lay people and the researcher uh, care about. And there is some discussion about is this good? Is this allowed? Uh, and, and so on. Okay, so um, we came to 2022, exciting. Almost we'll come to 2024. Uh, basically next time, next Wednesday, we are going to see what happens in 2023, what happened for ChatGPT. Um, but before we go into all of that, I still want to talk a little bit about the evaluation of these things. And before I move forward and use the remaining time for that, are there any questions? Yes. Um, what's the difference between the synthetic data and like other data that was generated by another yeah, that's a great uh, question. Um, synthetic data is usually more templated. And um, so you imagine a template where you human had actually, you know, written the uh, the template and then you have the, another model just fill in the, some blanks. Um, so that data is a more constrained that has less, you know, uh, diversity and kind of focusing on the skills. And then the other data, which is just generated uh, by the model, these are the data which are, uh, the prompts for this data are quite diverse. And this is something you would like the model to do the down the line. And uh, your model uh, is, um, you're using uh, versions of your model because all oh, this is also done iteratively, something I'll talk about next time. Uh, but imagine you are having a sequence of uh, your models that are progressively becoming better. So once you have these better versions of your model, they start to generate things that are not complete rubbish. And you have another model that you still don't know anything about and that you will learn on Wednesday uh, that can rate the generations of your model. And then you can reject those that have very low score and keep those that have sufficiently high score. So that generated data is very real in a way, right? It's closer to what you would see down the line where the synthetic data, uh, synthetic um, templated data is more constrained. Uh, but you, you're you right, you called me in like, this is, these are overloaded. Someone would say synthetic data to mean all of this. Um, so yeah, maybe don't get caught into uh, what is what exactly is synthetic data, rather that there are these two different ways of how, about how to enrich the instruction fine tuning data. Okay, so I kind of touched on a few things when I was demoing uh, stuff to you, um, but let, let's go over a few things in terms of the evaluation. So when you generate your responses, people have been using two different ways about how to evaluate them. 
if you have a task that's not necessarily a text generation task, but something like sentiment classification or multiple choice question answering. So the task where you have predefined choices, you have two options about how to go uh, into evaluating them if you are used a generating model to create the labels. You can use the probabilities uh, that come from the you know, distribution over vocabulary for the particular choices. So I don't know whether you see here, this is an example of multiple choice question answering, where you have question and you have four choices, A, B, C, D. And you struck the model to answer this question by telling you the letter of the right answer choice. So the model should respond with something like A, B, C, D. And instead of checking what exactly the model had generated, you can uh, focus only on the probabilities that each choice, A, B, or C, or D gets under your model. And then amongst those four, you choose the highest probable one. So the fact that the model maybe have given higher probability to some token that's outside of your answer choices doesn't bother you. You just ignore that fact and you are only looking at, given the four choices, what the model thinks is the highest probable one. This is something people will refer to as log likelihood evaluations. So as I said, this is just repeating what I said. You give the choices. For example, if you had sentiment classifications, you can say, what is the sentiment of this uh, sentence? A, positive, B, negative, answer with the letter. You can then focus only on the letters A and B in your vocabulary distribution. Uh, the issue here is that models will generate differently. Some models, due to the instruction fine-tuning, will say answer semicolon. Those that are fine-tuned uh, with stuff we are going to see next time are going to say, sure, let me help you with this, and so on. So the, the issue is that um, the models get uh, quite, uh, quite different um, uh, responses. Uh, so you want to constrain your generation, and you can constrain your generation in two easy ways. One is to add very specific instruction um, as to how to model should answer. As I said, you can say, well, answer with positive or negative, or you can give and or you can give for a few demonstrations. Show the model how do you want it uh, to, to respond. Um, okay, another option is that you generate the answer and then you check whether the generated answer matches your human wanted answer. And for this, you can use things like exact string match, whether the string that you have generated and the string that the uh, human had written for this instance, do they match? Or you can use a little bit weaker measures of the matching, such as blue score, for example. So these are two different things you will see uh, people do. Checking log probabilities coming from log softmax or generating the actual answers and doing the comparisons of the predicted strings with the uh, ground truth uh, strings. And then there are a few other things we want to do for few shot evaluation, but we are out of time, so we'll leave that. Um, I don't know whether I'll go into it or I'll just send you um, a note where you can read more about uh, that. Okay, and see you on Wednesday. Start working on your assignments soon. Highly recommend.